free to ask any questions throughout. I try to keep it fairly accessible in general, but uh, the devil's always in the details when it comes to security. So uh, depending how quickly I get through the slides, I encourage uh, lots of questions at the end. I can try and answer specifically to uh, what you, you're curious about. And also if I maybe got a little too technical and there's something that you don't understand, feel free to ask. So uh, security for digital companies, kind of just observations and lessons I've learned and advice from being a bit of a security nut. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm obviously Justin Bull. I'm a software developer at FreshBooks. I've been there for around a year now. Uh, I self-describe myself as a security enthusiast or not far, but by no means a professional because, uh, well, there's a, there's a little bit of a dirty taint to the security industry, so I try and distance myself a little bit from that. I'm eth ethically curious, and if you want to uh, obsessively follow me and see pictures of my food, you can get at me at Twitter. So today, uh, we're going to cover a few things, uh, four to be precise. I'm going to talk about CRA and we'll go into more detail of how I came across the heart bleed vulnerability and what I think they should have done or what they shouldn't have done and what went wrong and why we got into that mess in the first place. Uh, responsible disclosure, uh, I'll get more to that in a bit, but it's a mechanism that will that could have saved the CRA's bacon a little bit sooner uh, to maybe a lesser extent or uh, completely. Then uh, into the meat of the matter or into the meat of the sausage, uh, talking about the basic security things you can do at a digital company, be it one that's just starting up or one uh, that you might want to start investing in security mechanisms now that you've gained traction or maybe uh, you're a financial company, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, uh, questions and answers, and I'm totally sure we've got time permitting, so don't worry about that. So let's just pop the bubble right now. Everything is broken. There's nothing you can do. The world sucks. It's, I know. It's a sad fact. And uh, I highly recommend, and I will publish these, uh, publish these slides at some point, that you read this article uh, by Quinn Norton describing to the level in which we are so totally screwed. Uh, and that really gives you the frame of mind that uh, it's all about risk management and instant response. It's about appropriately deciding how much effort you want to put into your security and what levels of threats you're trying to protect yourself against, and then how do you deal with these things once they kind of get thrown into your lap. Um, Good point in regards to the presentation itself. We'll actually do a blog post about it and we'll include the, a link to the presentation, which you'll probably put on the slideshow or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, getting into the CRA, a case study, or as I like to call it, a, uh, a tale of woe. When, and I already had this conversation, when you think of the word government, uh, what do you think comes to mind? Uh, personally, uh, slow, inefficient lots of red tape and bureaucracy. Uh, and with these words in mind, you can see how we have a bit of a problem. The heart bleed attack, or bug, affected 17.5% of all website servers, according to Netcraft, that's around half a million websites. Um, the nature of heart bleed is quite uh, nasty, and that's because it's, the one, it's one of the few exploits and bugs that was so readily accessible to any average Joe, any sort of run-of-the-mill crappy 13-year-old hacker kid and the most advanced, you know, specific governments who try and launch, uh, launch offensive security techniques. Um, and when you run the attack, there is no trace. You get to essentially, as a, as a metaphor, get to reach your hand into some grab bag again and again and again and get small pieces of data. And sometimes it's garbage and sometimes it's a password to an administrator login account. And with that, you can uh, totally wreak havoc. And that act of grabbing into the bag cannot be logged or traced because it just looks like a regular visit to your web page. So who was affected? Uh, I'm not sure uh, how much you know about Heartbleed, but essentially uh, my personal servers, even I, the great Justin, could not even protect myself against uh, Heartbleed. Banks, TD was actually vulnerable for around uh, 12 hours, though by the time I, I checked it, it was totally safe. Uh, some people were on it before I was and uh, uh, found that even TD was not safe, and that's a very scary concept. Uh, almost every single digital company, as I'm kind of saying, like there's no way you could have known about that, and that's because, uh, and including the government of Canada, and that's because the way the Heartbleed uh, bug was discovered and disclosed starts to show the ugly uh, underside and underbelly of the security industry. So essentially, the maintainers of OpenSSL, the library in which the bug uh, was found, and OpenSSL powers a large part of the internet, 
uh, Google's security team approached them with this disclosure saying, hey, we found this horrible bug that will like bring the world to its knees. Uh, you should totally fix that. And they're like, cool. So let's you know, talk internally and reach out to key people that we feel are core infrastructure. So uh, apparently not the government of Canada, apparently not banks. Uh, just a few uh, key people, so Google, I don't even think Yahoo. Yeah, no, Yahoo was totally screwed for like two days. Um, but, you know, arbitrarily chose who they felt should know about it before it went public. Um, and this was using the responsible disclosure mechanism. So there are some failing points, and that, that kind of sucks. Um, but that's beside the point. Back to the CRA. Were they self-aware? Did they have a competent security, of security officer that would receive security bulletins or had any sort of ear to the ground in terms of what's going on with the technology they're implementing and the security implications they're in? And uh, clearly, that's a no. Uh, if they had a security officer, because I'm positive they, they do have one, or at least a team, or some you know, uh, young de developer who's curious about hacking and whatnot, someone should have known about it. And they, should have, they would have been able to patch it, and we wouldn't be in this mess, and I wouldn't have had my small little micro-famous uh, incident. So I consider that quite a fail. Next up, could the CRA be notified? If they had no way of knowing if uh, they were, in fact, uh, vulnerable through their own means, could someone at least tell them about it? And uh, I'd say no, no, and no. I had to scour their website for any sort of hint, for any sort of way I could get a hold of them through non-traditional means to specifically mention security issues with their application. Uh, I could only find tech support phone numbers and a special hotline for fraud reporting. Uh, and so I phoned uh, tech support for the My Account, My Business Account online filing feature, and I scared the living crap out of this like poor guy. And I said, there are hackers right now like attacking everything, and you need to shut down everything. And it was true. Um, a couple days before, the CRA's uh, Twitter account tweeted that something like 1.1k uh, Canadians were filing their taxes every day because it's in the heat of tax season. And for any minute the CRA is online as of uh, a day before the time I tried to report to them, anyone could just try and grab SINs and logins. And I wasn't even thinking about CRA administrative accounts or uh, employees' accounts, but just SIN numbers in general and personal, personally identifying information. And so it was true. I wasn't being alarmist. They needed to shut it down immediately, or at least patch the problem, which was actually quite simple. Upgrading a uh, library. Two lines, reboot, done. They, they would have saved themselves the problem. So the guy submitted a work order, which had to go all the way up to Ottawa, to which uh, a stakeholder could review and red tape, red tape, red tape slow, and uh, yeah, we're screwed. Um, I also found... Uh, I, I didn't want to just put my bets on the email, or sorry, on the phone number. So I also tweeted at them. I'm like, what's your email? Do you have an email for like specific security concerns? And uh, they gave me some general purpose media inquiry, uh, social media inquiry email. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll cover my bases and send that off. I also found uh, Canada actually has an anti-terrorism email uh, address. So I went to them. And I'm like, so the CRA is totally screwed. And I bet you there's a whole host of things that contains sensitive information, that's also screwed. You guys should, you know, talk to the departments and get that going. So I sent that along. Uh, two hours passed, the CRA was still online. I got no response from anyone. And I was like, well, that sucks. Considering the fact that there are Canadians filing taxes right now, and that's the perfect time where it's going into memory and the server and it's recent, so then the attacker could conceivably, quite non-theoretically, but applicably get sensitive information, I decided to tweet about it publicly. So this is the tweet that uh, local news found and, uh, you know, kind of what I like to think spurred the CRA into action to shut, it, shut down their service later. Uh, yeah, so this was around two hours after my fir uh, first phone call and it got retweeted a bunch of times and I think that hopefully would, if the CRA wasn't going to turn off their service, at least some people would withhold uh, themselves from filing the taxes. So by that metric, could the CRA be notified? Absolutely not. And then we move on to <laughs> when they finally found out, when maybe they finally saw that work order, or my tweet, or my email, or if the terrorism unit ever got around to, I don't know, talking to them, I have no idea if they did, uh, were they at least quick about it? And my answer to that is actually sort of, sorta, but not really. By governmental standards, I think a turnaround time of less than a day is actually pretty good. But the problem is, uh, does anyone know this guy? Steven? Or Stefan? He was the dude who 
broke into the CRA. He was the one who, uh, by my opinion, was able to get an administrative or employee level login and just see everyone's information. And in a weird, great panic, decided to delete 900 sins. Although Heartbleed is, an, is like you can't detect it, if you use Heartbleed to get a login for an administrator and then you log in as that administrator, you bet you that's logged. So that's how they got, they found out the guy. That's my, my opinion. And this was seen as a big screw up. And the guy got arrested and it's a big mess and that's how we got the extension deadline and that's why they turned off the servers for so long is because the RCMP had to launch an investigation to find this bugger. So, yes, it's great for uh, the government to, you know, respond in, you know, less than half a day. But given the fact that uh, Stephen or Stefan uh, kind of made a, made a, a mess of, of the server, it's another fail. And we all know about the 900 sins, but were there other attackers? As I said, Heartbleed's design, uh, the nature of how it exists, guarantees anonymity. There could have people. There could have been people. Maybe foreign governments. Maybe rogue hackers. Uh, nasty uh, private companies could be hitting our servers. Maybe they're trying to get uh, a specific target. Maybe they want a huge swath of it, and they could have s saved all that data. And they're sitting on it right now. We will never know. And that's a shitty reality. Uh, speaking back to everything is broken. This is how screwed we are. And this is why we need mechanisms in place. So what could the CRA have done? Um, they could have had a competent security officer or system admin. They could have had interdepartment cooperation with CSEC. Our spy agency and our agency responsible for establishing cryptographic methods for military action and such like that, they knew one day before uh, the news fell. And by that, I mean, before even the security bulletin was published for the world to see. They had internal knowledge that they could have shared with departments to prevent this whole mess to begin with. And uh, I think that speaks a bit to uh, how some uh, departments of the government can be a bit rogue, especially with CSEC, and given the light of Edward Snowden and NSA and the whole spy network, it starts to paint a bit of a gruesome picture where they don't care so much about uh, us, the people on the ground. And there should have been a way for me to tell them like quickly and fast. So maybe the people like a security officer would see that as the signal throughout all the noise of all the people trying to contact them every day and they could have made a decisive action to hopefully either shut it down or patch it and the risk of having Steven come in uh, was reduced uh, and the, the attack window was um, smaller. And then finally, be quick. Um, I couldn't have been the only one telling him about, oh sorry, CSEC, uh, Canadian Security, does anyone know the rest of it? It's, it's the branch of our government that's Canadian Security Encryption something. It's a department uh, of our, of our uh, government that's responsible for cryptographic communications. They've, I didn't even know they exist until last year because of Edward Snowden's leaks because they cooperate with the NSA. So if you think about NSA and what they do, that's roughly what these guys do. Um, they also work with CSIS, a more common one that's more specifically to actual spying during wartime. Um, right, and they should have been quick about it. I couldn't have been the only one uh, phoning and telling them. There was lots of security people. I know some guy. I know a guy from Montreal uh, uh, who is, you know, known for developing a few security applications, and he was running around telling core and critical infrastructure as well as me about all these things that they need to fix it. I actually wanted to see what other gov uh, governmental services were available online. And Service Canada has something called GC Key, which is this way for you to look at something to do with your business with the government. I phoned them, uh, they apparently already heard about it 30 minutes prior to my phone call and within two hours they had it fixed. Didn't have any downtime, it was just resolved and that's the sort of speed that I expected from the CRA. So that's it for covering the case study, the tale of woe of the CRA and I'm gonna move forward into our next section. And you may, <laughs> this is a bit of my security curmudgeonness coming out. I find a lot of people say we don't have time to think about security. We don't have money to think about security as an afterthought. And by design uh, in doing that, you kind of set yourself up to failure. But what I have to say to that as a counter, if you, if you truly don't have time or money, you can do something uh, called having a responsible disclosure policy, implementing that. And I consider that the bare minimum for security. A lot of people can contest that. But essentially, it allows you to officially define what users, hackers, researchers, average Joes, uh, how they can contact you about security issues. 
it's usually just a web page describing how you can get a hold of us, like how a, a researcher can get a hold of you and uh, define what you will and will not allow. <coughs> it's the cheapest investment you can make because you don't actually have to, well, you technically don't have to do anything. You put a page there and you wait for the reports to come in, assuming that people are actively looking at your stuff. And they do. They get curious. I do it myself. Um, maybe they feel good about uh, themselves that one day and they want to tell you about your problem. And then you can go ahead and fix it. And so instead of investing time with developers searching for things, you can just wait for them to be found out and then you can patch them as you go. So who has a responsible disclosure policy? Uh, FreshBooks has now added one. Uh, Microsoft, GitHub, Apple, Tesla Motors, yes, even the electric car company who doesn't have much to do with online security actually has a responsible disclosure policy as well. And that's because it lets major companies with lots and lots of users have the one person, that signal, get through all the noise of that customer support and really tell you about the stuff quickly so you can make decisive action. And it lets anyone tell you about it. But unfortunately, uh, it's surprisingly difficult to get right. Uh, and that's because you need to set up proper encryption and decide how you want to communicate with researchers. Uh, some security people, because they're all you know, crotchety curmudgeons who are jaded from the realities of, of the world and how screwed we are, uh, they will sometimes straight up refuse to communicate with you over email. They're like, oh, that's woefully insecure. What are you doing? I will not tell you about the problem that can bring your company down to its knees until you implement encryption. So in my opinion, if you want to implement responsible disclosure correctly, you have to think about some form of encryption where they feel comfortable about telling things about you. Even if you kind of totally decrypted in the background and stored in plain, just get it so you can be told about it. It's something that has to be uh, considered and thought about. And the next thing is how do you communicate these things to uh, communicate with researchers? How you have to define a, a standardized process because you will get some volume depending on the setup of your company. Some lessons I learned uh, when implementing responsible disclosure at FreshBooks is something that we launched in uh, spring, uh, mostly because of my tireless nagging about uh, having more security in our company. Um, it's pesky and time consuming if you have security debt. If you have a, com if you have a code base that's five or 10 years old, and it's riddled with bugs, and you know there's bodies in the swamp, but you just don't want to look, uh, you're going to get a lot of low-hanging fruit from automated scanners uh, in, uh, from our do uh, data so far, anecdotally, India, where they will download a tool called Burp Suite, and they will just point it at our servers, and it will uh, go through every single possible page and look for every possible low-hanging fruit exploit, and then they will send it off and say, give us money. Um, and that's kind of annoying. And that brings me to... You'll expect, you should expect a lot of bullshit, entitlement, and some comedy if uh, you find humor and uh, kind of the darker form. Uh, check out Clueless Sec on Twitter. It's, uh, it's a satirical account illustrating the sort of people with the broken English trying to uh, say, I won't uh, give you this security thing uh, unless you give me money or a t-shirt. And it turns out to be the most inconsequential, lowest risk security bug on Earth. And uh, as a counter to that, expect to be humbled. If you think you have Fort Knox, you don't. And if you have this in place, you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised? Uh, not so pleasantly surprised about how you need to get on your shit and fix some stuff. And a lot of people ask me, is it worth it? And I think for the 1,000 annoying emails you might get in a year, that one that will save your company is totally worth a $1,000 reward that you pay it and you can be very thankful that it wasn't someone malicious who found it or someone who wanted to blackmail you, which is also something that can totally happen. So responsible, responsible disclosure, you should totally have it. As a bare minimum, don't offer a reward or swag. Maybe credit on the page as a little hall of fame that people like credit because they're trying to build their own brand. Um, tell them what's acceptable and what's not. Don't let them say, don't say, please try and knock us down and brute force our site live. And if you can take us offline, then yeah, that's responsible disclosure. Good job. Don't let them do that. Say, you only accept, accept certain parameters and types of, uh, of hacking and definitely don't hack our customer live data. Create a test account, hack your own account. And uh, the most important part, provide a special email or a direct phone number that they can call and say, yo, I have a problem. Here it is. And you can uh, get on that quickly. So that concludes the responsible disclosure section. And now we're getting into the fun specifics, security 101 for digital agencies, or, not how, to get, or how to not get hacked within a year. But I'm not promising you anything on that. Just a quick question. Yeah. The responsible disclosure, does that put a bullseye on that 
your code gets back that more people will actually then go try to hack it? So there, yeah, so there, there's conflicting thoughts on this, on, on responsible disclosure. I like to think the ones who will act, okay, so first off, responsible disclosure is a bit of a keyword or a buzzword in the security industry. If you find something wrong with a company on your day to day and you've decided to not uh, actively exploit it, the first thing you will do is Google that company's name and then the words responsible disclosure. If they have a policy, you're like, sweet, I can make some cash or sweet, I can get a t-shirt and some cred and I'll tell them about it and I'll feel good about myself for being moral and ethical and whatnot. If there is a hacker who's like, you know, bad blood, want to fuck up some person, uh, maybe it's a specific customer in your service that they want to target explicitly and ruin their lives, or maybe they want to shut down your company or mess with you, uh, they're just going to go in. Like, they don't give a crap about responsible disclosure. They're just going to pen test or penetration test your system, uh, regardless of having this policy or not. But what it, what it will uh, attract in terms of bullseye, like I said, are those people who seem to just want free shit, something for nothing, uh, and just tell you about inconsequential stuff. But they'll never really do something. Uh, you might get, there's always a risk that someone could uh, conceivably start out uh, more moral uh, and, and right and ethical through the responsible disclosure, but then realize they found like the cash cow and they decide to blackmail you. That is a risk. But uh, if they're not doing that, that mean like without responsible disclosure, that blackmailable thing could totally exist and could totally be picked up by someone who would have never known about responsible disclosure in the first place, and you'd be in the exact same predicament. And the idea is when you establish a proper communication, is that you're not so brash and rash with these uh, with these people that you don't piss them off and force you into the blackmailed scenario, anyways. And that's why they're curmudgeons. You kind of have to play their game a bit, but uh, ultimately it's helping you. Um, but yeah. The first thing, and I'm surprised LinkedIn didn't do this. I was very upset with them. Uh, encrypt your passwords. No excuses, none, bloody do it. Um, oh, it's crashing. Nope, there we go. So the consequences. Domino effect with customer accounts. Uh, raise, raise your hands if you've reused the same password for a software or service that you use, and it's the same one as your email. Show of hands. Yeah, okay. Now, imagine if that service or provider did not encrypt your password. Imagine if an attacker either specifically got yours or the entire user table. An attacker, the first thing they're going to bloody do is turn around and check that password on your email. We all know that email is a bit of the keys to the kingdom, uh, and they can easily reset passwords on other systems, gain those access, uh, perform identity thefts, sell it off to people. It's nasty. There's a huge black market in it, and that's bad. You owe it to your customers to encrypt your pa uh, their passwords. So if it doesn't even give you a benefit, it will save them from an account takeover. And that's what happened with uh, a guy who wrote, uh, who was featured in a Wired uh, magazine article two years ago about how between Amazon and Apple, this exact thing happened to him, and he had his entire online presence wiped out and corrupted. Um, so yeah, ID theft, not good. Um, and bringing it back to you, there's a permanent black mark on your company record. You will be forever known as that company that got hacked. And worse off, you're forever known as the company who got hacked and stored their passwords in plain text. Who, what's wrong with you? Uh, I believe Sony uh, got into some hot shit with uh, Lulzsec a couple of years ago uh, with their online PlayStation network. There was some DDoSing, they knocked some stuff offline, but they also got credit card information. And that included personal addresses, names, and passwords, if I'm not mistaken. But the credit card information was encrypted because of PCI compliance. So silver lining, something to be happy about there. Uh, the worst thing is, imagine that domino effect does occur. Imagine if uh, a hacker does compromise your entire uh, user table and like 100 of your, like 100,000 users get totally ruined. Their lives are a mess. They have loans taken out in their name, cars, whatever, or it doesn't really matter. They could turn around and go, we're suing you in a class action lawsuit for failing to provide decent security measures that a common person or a reasonable person would, uh, would expect in this day and age. So that's not a good place to be. And the final uh, argument is it's so cheap and easy to do. Like, why not? It, it's maybe a day's worth of developer's time. It's, it's worth the investment. So that being said, don't roll your own crypto is a common phrase you'll hear from crypto cryptographers and mathematicians. It's a bit counterintuitive counter from my last argument, but the thing is, um, 
who should use a password hashing library? There are mathematicians and cryptographers who make their living on coming up with the weirdest, most obscure, and random way to like garble passwords so they can never, ever be broken. Uh, you should trust them. Don't write your own code. Use the libraries that have been tested over time that you can feel comfortable in using. Does anyone remember 2000, like the thousands, uh, when kind of web services were kind of coming up? And if you've ever written your, your own code, especially in PHP, you wanted to, you've heard about, oh yeah, I shouldn't store my passwords in plain text. So you jump to MD5 or SHA-1 to hash or encrypt your passwords. And maybe you've heard the salt thrown around. Does, has anyone heard of those, uh, those terms? Or am I, yeah, so that's more of a developer specific thing. But it's, an, it, it's proving the point of don't roll your own crypto. Those are uh, mangling hashing algorithms not designed for passwords. They're meant for very fast, very specific uh, checksums on file integrity. And you're really hammering a screw there. Get more into the specifics, pass these on to your developers. If you're choosing a password hashing library, it should be using anything uh, that's named bcrypt, scrypt, uh, password-based derivation function two, that's a handful, uh, or an algorithm designed for passwords. And that's how you know um, you're setting yourself. If you're gonna do this in the first place, you're gonna do it right. And you surprisingly want it to be slow. And you're like, Justin, what the hell? Why on earth would you want something to run slowly as a benefit? That seems ridiculous. And the answer is, it's a numbers game. You want to make it as expensive as possible for an attacker to brute force your password. If they attack your system and they get everything and they got nothing but pa garbled encrypted passwords, they're like, shit. Like, Uber flips using bcrypt. That's going to cost me one second to test one password one time for one user. If I want to try and get a full password dump, it's going to cost me an inordinate amount of cash to do that. And so suddenly, your average Joe hacker, your you know, corporate competition, and maybe some governments are no longer uh, able to attack your stuff. So unless your adversary is the NSA, you're pretty much safe. So that's really cool. Uh, getting more into password specifics, you're going to encrypt them. Um, and this is getting more into the opinion side of things and depending on what your company provides and what you want to build. But you should enforce password minimums. I don't like telling users what to do, so I say at least make it eight characters. Don't worry about special characters, never in lowercase. It's your own grave you're going to dig if you choose a bad password. Um, expire a login after eight hours, a day, a month. It really depends on what's going on. If you're a financial company, I would advocate expiring after eight, eight hours. If you're Reddit, a month. Who cares? Um, follow good changing, resetting password patterns. And that's a whole other topic. I just recommend that if you're implementing such a routine that you have your developers look at it and research what the best way to go about it. Um, and on that thread, beware of bad security questions. Imagine if you have a, if you're a user and you have a wonderfully secure 40 character, completely random password that you've only memorized and has never written anywhere, but then you have the security question, what's your favorite color red? This is the first thing the security users, uh, the security person or attacker is going to do is going to check to see if they can just reset your password by guessing all the favorite colors. You've now completely bypassed your most secure mechanism with this backdoor concept. And this has been proven to have happened again and again. That's how the Amazon, Apple, Guy, and Wired got pwned, actually. It was through these reset questions that could be easily researchable. Something was like, where do you go to school? And it's listed on his resume. <sighs> if people are attacking stuff, lock them out. If you guessed a password wrong too many times, make them wait five minutes temporarily. Oh, sorry. Do you have a perspective on dual Absolutely love it. I didn't mention it because I forgot. But two-factor authentication is amazing because it combines two concepts of something you know and something you have. So something you know could be researched, potentially guessed, extrapolated, but with something you have, the attacker now has to be physically present or at least be smart enough to know how to break into your phone or um, like a key fob if you use RSA or any other sort of two-factor authentication mechanisms. So you've, you've really kind of limited the attack surface for yourself uh, quite a fair bit, or for your users. For financial applications, absolutely provide that option. I wouldn't advocate ena enabling it by default, though. Uh, and there's lots of libraries available for two-factor auth as well that makes it unbelievably seamless. I, sorry, sorry to hijack. Yeah. Uh, the reason you wouldn't do it by default is just its user experience? Yeah. Uh, don't, uh, until we get into a world where security is more of a default focus, the idea of a user going, oh, fuck, now I have to go get my smartphone to log in for this quick thing is crappy. You'll get people not adopt your, to not adopt your technology, and they'll forever know it as kind of the uh, paranoid software. 
when I was um, when I was living in England, um, HSBC Bank um, was um, the most advanced one in terms of security, and I actually had like a little calculator that I carried in my wallet all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to log in online, I had to use my password. Yep. Plus, I had to reset this, and it gave me a unique password every yeah. time. So what? that was my second method of identifying like this is good, that this is me. Yeah. And I actually loved it. Like I know that it took me a couple of seconds more. Yeah. But I felt so much more secure. Like I came back to Canada, I was like, I don't, I don't feel as secure anymore. Mm -hmm. Like because I've experienced that. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, there are some sad realities I found about t found out about TD Bank uh, the other day. Uh, they truncate your passwords after eight characters. So if you choose a password longer than that, they don't care. They throw it away and log you in. And uh, oh, someone's angry. Um, so that that can mean one of two things. That means uh, either they're storing stuff in plain text because they know how to truncate at the appropriate length, which is fucking mortifying, considering that contains all of my financial information and the ability to make me bankrupt. Or hopefully the second one, where they just because of legacy systems and they haven't prioritized it, they cut off your password after eight characters, then hash that and store it. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Pa uh, Two-factor authentication is great because it's pretty, it's, it's not disrupting, too disrupting to users, and it's really secure, uh, depending on how you go about it. Um, by chance, the, H, uh, the HSBC, did it have the letters RSA anywhere on it? I, I can't recall. Okay. It, um, it, was, it was all the numbers. Yeah. It was like five, five or six numbers. So okay. Um, but going back to everything is broken, a company called RSA, they kind of actually came up with a, a lot of encryption mechanisms and software and products. Uh, they uh, issue key fobs for two-factor authentication, secure, uh, reasonable codes like that. And there was an instance, uh, I believe two years ago or maybe one year ago, where they got hacked and someone stole the secret seed key. And with that, they could conceivably uh, generate and mimic and discover and anticipate the number before you push it so they can sideline it and get in. But they still need your password. But holy shit, right? Everything is broken. Um, but yeah, uh, lock them out if they guess wrong too many times. Uh, we all know what happened with iCloud recently. Apparently, uh, people like to store nudes up in the cloud. And to reflect, reflect that reality, what Apple should have done has uh, basically, if you try too many times, lock them out a little bit, maybe send a flag, send an email, notify the user, hey, suspicious activity. You can build a heuristics program to figure out that you log in consistently from North America, so suddenly the Chinese IP is suspicious and you want to perform an additional step. Um, there, there was suspicion in the security industry on how the iCloud, uh, iCloud attack happened, and that was because they discovered an endpoint, an endpoint where you could constantly ask it about customers and if the customer uh, exists or not, uh, and it wouldn't rate limit, it wouldn't throttle, it wouldn't uh, send up a red flag to a security officer where it's like, oh, that's totally hacking activity, lock them out. Moving on, um, SSL. TLS, aka HTTPS, also known as that fantastic green lock. Uh, you should totally have it. You should totally have it no matter what. And the reason why I say that is because of these fellas. We have your crazy hacker, uh, government, foreign government agencies who bulk collect data and, you know, directly undermine encryption techniques so they can globally make people more vulnerable. Uh, vulnerable. And maybe uh, if you decide to be a little annoying, the later, later years they can look back over 10 years of your history and kind of compromise your person. Um, yeah, the nasty hackers. And even that innocent person in the cafe, uh, you go, or even here, uh, the, the guest Wi-Fi network. There's nothing to prevent me from this computer or even my phone to listen in to everything that you have done that's non-encrypted. SSL, TLS will prevent that. Uh, by default. Sorry, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, oh yeah, and finally, your competitor. So, respect your customers and give them the privacy that they deserve. It's not that expensive. You don't have to buy the SSL EV, like $400 a year uh, solution. Even the most basic $10 a year one will do. You want to just provide basic uh, encryption. There's a whole other argument about why it's flawed, but we won't, we don't have to get into that. That's not the point. You can get the encryption. And, uh, some brand awareness. Users find comfort in the, the green padlock. That makes them feel safe. And even if it's a false sense of security, that might get them to purchase your product. If I visited two websites that offered financial services and I saw one that was encrypted and one that wasn't, I'd more likely put trust in the encrypted product. 
Uh, next up, get authorization and authentication, also known as auth and auth. Sorry, yeah? Uh, I would advocate always, uh, but technical restrictions I can understand. So you can get a, a specific subdomain called login.yourcompanyname.com, issue an SSL specifically for that. And so all core login functionality and sit like account management can happen over SSL. Uh, the argument is that sometimes SSL can have a, an additional performance cost. If you're a very large company, it can uh, increase the cost of just running servers. Um, and there is devil in the details in having an insecurity warning getting displayed if an image is loaded on your site that's not also through SSL. So I can see the argument for just login based functions. But uh, absolutely, yes. Because without this, if I type in a username and password to log in, and so if I'm at a cafe and there's some devious little diva over there uh, sniffing to everything, she can get my login information and game over, right? Um, so yeah, getting more into the specifics, auth and auth. This is basically just a uh, thing a concept that developers came up with saying uh, authorization, uh, are you are you what you say who you say you are and are you allowed to do what you said say you can do? Um, so research, again, common libraries, don't do it yourself. It's really simple. Most common languages and frameworks already have them available. Uh, depending on your uh, tech savviness, uh, Rails, Ruby on Rails, they have a library called CanCan and um, Devise, they're solid rock tested. It's great, go ahead and use them. And yeah, a solid login mechanism should be the foundation of your application. You should try and build around these services so you don't have to think about applying them after the fact, but everything is built around them so you don't have to spend so much time and energy and money trying to come up with security. And depending on the company or service that you're building, if you have multi-level access, if these words kind of appear in, uh, in your app, you want to think about researching or building ACL access control list, very boring term, to, yeah, make sure that the guest can't, in fact, like kind of guess where the admin URL is and then suddenly do admin actions. You want to make sure that everything they try and do, are they authorized to do that within their role or definition of who they are within your application. And this is getting into the more of the designing things, but this is the sort of stuff that your developers should be thinking about when they're coming up with scoping documents on building features or new services or, or products. Every company I've ever worked for at, uh, has been guilty of this at some point or another, failing to put an ACL, and from a curious hacker to just the average Joe guessing or stumbling or accidentally finding uh, pages, doing things they're not supposed to. Uh, and that's not cool. So that's a lot of crap. Uh, what if you have no money, or sorry, you've got money, but you have no time, and you don't know how screwed you are, and you really just want to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, hire a pen tester. They will set fire to your code, uh, not the rain. And uh, you will be sad, but at least you'll know what's going on, and you'll pay a pretty penny for it. But uh, you can be pretty damn sure that, yeah. How often would you do that? So if you haven't gone PCI compliant, and PCI compliance is something that you need to think about, part of the, the rules is that you will have to hire a firm at some point. So just wait for that to become a requirement. If you're not going with PCI compliance, um, I would say it's when you have a dev team that is not knowledgeable about security, you have a code base that's been around for a while, and you know something's wrong, or developers have been complaining something's wrong, but you don't know the scope and breadth of it. You do it as a one-off, um, and after that, once you have a sense, you try and educate your developer team. Maybe encourage uh, like lunch and learns where they can teach themselves or sponsor them to go off to, like not DEF CON because that's a party, but like um, security B-sides, Sector, uh, do it regularly. So, concrete hmm. example, we actually just did a penetration okay. test on ours. Like, should we do another one in six months because that's a good time to check it I actually don't know. Um, do what feels right. Uh, if you have a QA team, that all the I can only complain so much. <laughs> uh, if you have a QA team, uh, I'm going to speak in a moment about OWASP. They can download a testing guide that's focused on security. Uh, and they can go through it and they find lots of holes still again and again, especially if it's new code that has uh, surfaced or been created or features that have happened since the auditor has come in. That's an indication that your security team isn't up to snuff and maybe it's worth it, yes, to invest in another audit uh, or penetra penetration test. But if you feel like you have a competent dev team or a culture that you know is decently okay, you can make that call whether you feel like it's appropriate or not. Uh, but the caveat on that is uh, beware of the snake oil. 
Uh, we have a lot of charlatans in the security industry, and they will sell you snake oil so fast, and they will charge you so much for it. I don't know who I can uh, point you to, because I have no connections with the uh, penetration industry. But um, <laughs> watch out. If you feel like something's wrong, go to another friend who maybe is security conscious, or another company that's done security well, or it's just a good product, and ask them about, hey, what do you feel about this, uh, this company? Are they worth their stuff? And moving that on, uh, this wonderful uh, organization, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, they published something called the OWASP Top 10. Now, the OWASP Top 10 is the top 10 most nasty and easiest vulnerabilities for web applications. This is the sort of stuff that you should get every dev in your company into it until they dream about it, because that way, when they're programming up front, they think about security and they will avoid the pitfalls that so many people fall into that were so bad that OWASP actually had to build a list for. Um, it covers, yeah, the most common and dangerous. Uh, you may have heard terms like uh, cross-site cross scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injections, all those kind of really easy to screw up, but pretty impactful problems. This is all covered in there, and how to protect for it, and what you should think about when building systems. And as I was saying with QA, Print out the OWASP guidebooks. They're tombs. They're crazy verbose. They're, we're talking like, you know, formal technical spec documents from the 90s. They're nasty. But they're great desk references in case someone gets curious about a very specific thing that they want to know more about. So that's pretty much it for uh, security. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. That's pretty much it for security uh, in terms of developing code. But I want to talk about a little bit about operational security. And this is the sort of stuff that is often forgotten about. And if you are in a hotly competitive field where you worry about corporate, corporate espionage or if you're a Department of Defense and uh, maybe you have to think about adversarial governments or, or just a hacker that uh, you've caught the attention of and you want to tighten down your stuff, this is the sort of things you want to think about. Uh, don't email passwords. There are a lot of things in a company where you subscribe to services that have to be shared within the company. A lot of marketers maybe use Marketo and uh, there's a single username and password for your entire company. And in order to disseminate that password, you email it around within your internal email. Don't fucking do that. That's bad. Email, something like 80% of it, no. I'm not going to tell you a stat that's probably incorrect, but a good large amount of email is sent in unencrypted in the clear, and it's cached by all the various servers and routers around the net in order to get into your inbox. You might have a specific internal email, but still, that's bad practice, because what if uh, your Wi-Fi is compromised and someone's sitting outside, and maybe they can't access the computers, but they're sniffing everything going back and forth? You can get the Marketo password, and they can wreak some havoc. How uh, does Gmail from that perspective? Gmail has implemented Start TLS. Um, I can't remember what year, so you're good. If it's Gmail to Gmail endpoint, it's encrypted, so woohoo. Uh, if it's Gmail to Yahoo, no. If it's Gmail to uh, some other oh, Joe Schmo okay. service, not so much. It requires both the receiver and the sender to both have this feature turned on, which is not a default setting, which is hard to do because people don't care about security. So as a uh, precaution, uh, don't do it. So much that don't do it twice. Uh, and I actually have a solution for this that is, in my opinion, unbelievably easier, and it solves all the other problems about reusing passwords, and that is use a password management application. Uh, I swear by 1Password. It's uh, developed by a whole bunch of guys. Uh, the chief founder, in fact, who is in Canada, uh, it has the ability to integrate into the cloud so everyone can have it automatically synced to their computers, but not by default. And you can choose that sync provider so you can be comfortable that there isn't like a backdooring situation in the realm of a cloud uh, concept like Dropbox, although I use Dropbox. Um, and Essentially, in case you're not familiar with a password management application, you have one single password and it unlocks and decrypts this vault of all passwords you've ever owned for every service. And with one password, uh, you literally push the hotkey of command uh, backslash and it will look into its database and know you're on the login page of the site you're supposed to be and just plug it in and press enter and you don't even have to type. It's actually less work than uh, trying to remember all the passwords. And it also has generators so they're secure if they're single use for that one service. So if one is compromised, you just have to know to only update that password and all your other places are safe. Uh, KeyPass and LastPass or competitors are there um, as well. I think they're okay, but I am beholden to 1Password and they have a very active development process. They love feedback and they actually care. Even if you don't do that, you can use sticky notes, because at least that's not in a technological fashion. Uh, it kind of forces you to use memorable passwords or dictionary ones, but fuck, you can do that. Just don't email passwords. Uh, yeah, 
I have companies that actually use the sticky note policy, and that is actually more secure than emailing it. Um, so not everything about security is about security. Some of it is about good public relations. And if you ever get breached, if you're ever screwed, and you have to uh, talk about it, which you should do, never sweep it under the rug, um, use everything you got. If you have social, tweet about it. If you have a blog, do a technical write-up. Sorry, yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, use, use, uh, do a technical write-up and tweet that link. You have an email base, notify your users proactively and tell them about what you've learned, what you're going to do differently, and how you're on this because you're aware of it and you're not just hiding under, under uh, the rug. And if you've got media attention, maybe even leverage that if you're able to get press to talk about how you generally take security from, uh, you care about security, but in this instance you got screwed, but this is the, thing, this is the scope in which you were breached and how you're going to make that better and uh, really speak the truth. Uh, yeah, see a pattern. Basically talk about it. Give the facts and the truth. Yes, spin it. Save face a little bit, but not too much because if you kind of get caught in a technical lie, you, you lose that trust in that brand that we're trying so hard to maintain with this good, you know, voluntary disclosure, transparency, and honesty. So if you do it right, you might escape unscathed. Uh, that's it. So uh, specific questions, if you got any. I talk too much. Um, are we talking about in the realm of these tools scraping uh, social media and how the scraped things are, are in their security or the tools themselves and so how they... Scraping, how dangerous it will be, you know, besides which they get scraped? Um, it depends on what the users do. Uh, there is a Twitter account that uh, tweets all, no, it retweets all of the people that have tweeted their awesome new credit card they just got with the full number. And uh, unfortunately, those are actually scraped and then sold on the black market. Uh, and that's just the reality. Uh, if your service is so globally accessible like Twitter that you have kind of uh, the maybe not so security conscious folk or kind of the more oblivious folk using it, there's nothing that can be really done about that uh, short of kind of tailoring content. Uh, as a scraper, maybe you want to think about ethics and you have a mechanism that discovers those and maybe notifies them or uh, discovers it and doesn't log it within your own system so if someone ever compromises you, they don't get this treasure trove. But uh, in those scenarios, I don't think they're, it's too much of a consequence. It's not a big, big deal in my opinion. Any other questions? Yeah? I'm curious, at, at FreshBooks, is this what you do security or is it broader to that dev role? So I'm a full stack developer. I work as a software developer as my day job. Uh, but in that, I've spearheaded the security team. I'm the team lead of the security team, and that's uh, mostly to deal with incident response through responsible disclosure, but also seeding uh, changes to our underlying security structure. So going forward, we're more secure. Rats on the big rounders. Sorry? Rats on the big rounders. Yeah, thank you. Good question. You had mentioned one of the slides that in order to make it harder and more expensive for hackers to extract passwords, you should make it, you know, Load time for about a second, I think you said. Yeah, sorry. Is I, that all for the page itself, the load time for the page itself, or what, what was that one second about it? Yeah, sorry. So I, I didn't speak to that, and I meant to. Uh, when logging in, in an instance where conceivably a user gives you a plain text password and you have to perform the hashing function to verify it, mm -hmm. uh, that's when you'd want to. Oh, okay. So the instances that would happen would be changing a password and logging in, or checking a password. Uh, the perceived load time of a login session is already pretty slow. Users expect that. An additional 0.5 seconds or a section isn't that much. But in the context of a user or an attacker who's constantly trying to brute force every single password, um, it becomes inordinately expensive and time consuming. So uh, that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, Moore's Law factors in. In fact, that, that table I showed you was from 2009 in the technical paper of Escript, one of the encryption algorithms. Uh, those numbers can basically be uh, doubled 
because of Moore's law. And uh, you might want to think about uh, adjusting every year or so the work factor, the number in which it becomes hard for a password to be generated, such that that, that one second desirable uh, outcome is uh, maintained. Uh, yes? Yeah, just to follow up that question, I think one of the topics to um, increase the time to actually possible be the instance of the research time to be a number of the measures on the website, right? So you can choose, yeah, uh, and that, that's a common strategy to slow it down is to provide capture. In fact, Google will do it after 10 uh, failed login attempts to slow them down and f verify that you're a human and not a bot. The problem with that is that I personally dislike captures. They annoy me. Uh, second off, it's technically illegal in some countries and states because it's not accessible. People who are blind or deaf and like, uh, need certain screen readers or assistive technologies, they can't parse that and they're fucked. Uh, and so some, some states and countries have passed law for forbidding CAPTCHA, though that's not doing jack shit. Um, I think it's better off to rely on the encryption to slow people down than to provide inconvenience. How about the campus? Have you been some of the parties? We have an accessibility guidelines and format and standard, though I don't know if it's enforced. I think it's more of a recommended thing. Uh, I, think, I think you're able to use CAPTCHAs. But even if it was illegal, there's no enforcement. It's kind of just a, sh it's a show of... Um, I don't know, it's paying lip service to it. Uh, yes? I can ask a question about capture. For example, yeah. for me, if I use my cell phone, usually I cannot use the system, mm -hmm. first of all. And the second question, I remember it was a permission, some software can bypass capture. Yes. So it's not protected completely. Um, image recognition technology has gotten so good that capture can be broken better than humans. That is true. Um, it is also really cheap to pay humans in India to solve the CAPTCHAs manually. There is a, there is a service that you can buy that is uh, people sitting in a room all day entering in CAPTCHAs and doing the spam or the, the malicious activity that you're trying to do. So even if, we, even if uh, computers haven't solved it better than us, you can still, you, it's still cheap to hire a human to solve your problem. And depending on who you are, if you're at the NSA, as I always like to go back to, or if it's someone who's got a lot of uh, you know, pockets lined with cash, you can solve it with humans. So captures have been broken for maybe four years, I'd say, is when they stopped being useful in the realm of security. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, one more. About the protocol. Yes. Uh, if company doesn't use this protocol, mm -hmm. but wants to start using how much it costs, do they need to use special provider, service, or something? The SSL uh, uh, industry is a whole can of worms. Uh, if you want to just get the bare bones, you want to offer SSL, and your technology does not use a content delivery network, a CDN, or anything special. It's really just a single server or a load balance server that you own. You can, you can only pay 10 bucks a year. That's like the cheapest you can buy. Uh, you can go all the way up to 400 300 to 400 uh, dollars a year, which might make sense if you're, uh, you know, a company that's willing to make those sort of investments, because they're it's really a small change in. Yeah, there's really no reason to not use it. It's just we haven't fostered a culture where people think about encrypting by default yet. A day, less than a day. Uh, I can, and if you're not tech savvy, it can it can take maybe an hour or two. You have a developer, they can have it done in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's you generate something from your on your computer or your server. You send that file to the to this to the provider of the SSL. They do some magic in their system. It takes maybe 10 minutes. They email you back with a special file that, when combined with the original one, encrypts your system. Done. It's like it's a it's pretty simple to do. But there's lots of uh, caveats in that. The concept of you're trusting this provider to, they're essentially, they're selling trust. They're not really selling encryption, they're selling trust. And what if the certificate, they're called the certificate authorities, what if they are rogue? What if they are governments with malicious intent? Uh, you may have heard of the, the company name called DigiNotar a couple of years ago. Um, and they were a, a certificate authority that was hacked and hackers started issuing valid, 100% valid by the system that we have created certificates for Google and Yahoo Mail and managed to infect certain places such that uh, if in the cafe scenario, 
if I'm trying to snoop in on your stuff and you have an encrypted uh, encrypt, uh, connection, I, swap, I, I lie to your computer using technology and hacking to issue the wrong security certificate so you see the green padlock, uh, but I totally can control it. I can totally decrypt everything you're seeing and there's no, there's no way for you to know about it. And that's because of some we supposedly trusted uh, way up there that governments and, and, and um, uh, committees and policymakers have decided that should be trusted, and it's because we decided to trust them and uh, they did not take security. Uh, they did not implement appropriate levels of security. Uh, and that you can go on forever about SSL. Uh, people think it's snake oil, but at the end of the day, for you know the, the hackers and the not government uh, uh, actors, you can, you can just pay the 10 bucks and get that added level of security, if not just more brand trust uh, for your product. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.